All right, so let's see. Oh, what could me? Um, so we're live on YouTube now. I'm gonna just keep bringing in people here. You can hear the, the bell going off in the steeple. Looks like they've got that really well yeah. timed now. For a, it, was, it was getting pretty far off for a little while there. Um, hi, Tom. So the first, for anybody that's been here before, the first part is gonna be pretty much um, the same. We've ended up mostly with different people every time. So um, I'm just going to go through the same initial um, presentation. And then the second half um, will be the um, sort of question and answer comment um, period. So um, if anybody that's you know already seen that initial part um, wants to avoid having to hear that again, you can feel free to log off and come back on or just um, have it in the background, but it'll probably be um, the second um, hour that'll be the sort of discussion part. Um, Hallie's presentation is a little bit different from that first one. Um, so that'll be a, a little bit different. Um, we'll still show the two videos again and um, my presentation will be pretty much similar. It's gonna wait another minute or two. Um, Bob should be joining us. Um, that's a good reminder. Now every, whenever I get a phone call now, it's like the whole, every, all my devices ring, the computer rings. There we go, turn this off here. Um, Okay, here's another. Oh, here's Caleb. Caleb's gonna take notes. And um, hi, Caleb. Hey. So, Holly, if you can just kind of um, watch the um, attendees panel. Oh, oh, shoot, can I, are you not? I probably need to make you a co host, huh? Oh yeah, thank you. Do the same for you, Caleb. Um, so that you can kind of watch if anybody's audio seems to be causing problems, you can just go ahead and mute everybody. Um, so yeah, this is the, um, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. This is the um, third in a series of um, community conversations, just basically aimed at being a really broad overview of some of the work that the town is doing. The two grants um, that we have, one of which is looking um, kind of specifically at some design options and engineering for Montgomery Dam and the seawall in Harbor Park. And the other is sort of a um, broad watershed wide um, feasibility, fish passage and flood risk um, reduction uh, feasibility study. So we're gonna kind of go over um, the history of how we got here, what we've looked at so far, um, what some of what we know and what we don't know, the reasons that we got the grants and um, some of the connections to the climate change work that the town is doing for planning and the connections with the um, watershed school and how they've been helping us. And then the second part after that will be um, really just an opportunity to say anything, whether that be a, a specific um, question or concern or comment or idea about um, one of the specific sites that we talk about um, or, you know, just a, you know, really anything connected to um, the, the McGonagall watershed. And we're going to use uh, those comments to kind of help us to craft um, 
the next steps, get a sense of the types of questions and comments that the community has. And then um, as with anything that has to do with the town, gonna be you know, a, lot more, a lot more steps um, involved. Nothing um, that happens in Camden regarding town properties can happen without um, a full town vote, whether that be a vote on the, on the budget or a referendum. Um, so we're not in a decision-making phase right now. We're in a, um, the phase of trying to collect all of the information that um, the community is gonna need to be able to make um, decisions in the future. But you know, nothing that we talk about today is um, you know, a decision that the select board can make alone or really that any one entity could make um, alone, except for, I mean, I suppose there are a couple privately owned um, properties involved um, and you know, the town wouldn't have much say over some of that, but um, pretty much in, you know, in every case, there's, there's a lot more um, planning and um, community input and voting that has to happen before anything can happen. So um, to get started here, I'm gonna pull up, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and share the sound too. And um, just go over, let's see, slideshow. Uh, okay, from start. So um, in the start, and you can feel free to, um, if some of this is stuff that you've already seen, you can um, tune out for a little bit and come back when it's time. Um, for the more of the discussion, the basic overview here is going to be the same as um, similar to the first two talks because mostly we're getting um, the same people. I mean, excuse me, the different people on each. Um, we're going to start out with um, the uh, a video about um, some of the history of the river and the reasons for looking at fish passage. Then um, Hallie Arno, who's a student at the College of the Atlantic, um, is going to kind of go over the larger context of ecological resilience and strategies to increase and protect habitat um, for threatened and endangered species and how um, some of the work being done throughout the region, how that um, ties into what we're uh, looking at on McGonagook. Um, and then we're also gonna show a video from Mid Coast Conservancy about a um, uh, the work that they've done on the Sheepskit River and some of the challenges and opportunities there it can sort of give you an idea of um, you know just the experience of a different community that has some similarities to us. Um, then um, Hallie's going to talk a, a little bit more and um, maybe Caleb too about climate change. And what that means for the mid coast, um, we hear a lot about this in the in the national news. But there are a lot of um, unique aspects of it for our local area um, that aren't necessarily the same throughout the country. So we're going to look at this uh, some of the studies that the watershed school has done um, for the town and some of the what the other um, planning and scientific assessments have shown us we need to be preparing for. Um, and then we'll basically just give a, an overview of all of the different dams and assessments um, that are happening so that can, people can understand which ones we're talking about. And um, also I'll give a little bit more information about the uh, different two different grants that we have and where we are in that process. And then it will be the about the second half of this, about the second hour will be um, public discussion questions and comments that will, just like with the first um, two, that's all going to be, uh, first of all, uh, archived on YouTube, but then also um, Caleb is going to be taking minutes and um, recording, you know, all of the, um, all of the questions and comments that come up so that this can be um, made available and also presented to the um, select board so that um, we can have a little bit better perspective on com the community um, input before we, you know, move into having this as, as more of a select board agenda item. So um, we'll start off here 
with um, just a video to give a little bit of um, context. This is actually a video I made for the Camden Middle School. Where did my cursor go here? Um, can't see. Growing up in Camden, I never thought much about the river that runs through our town. Other than the deep, slow-moving part known as Shark Tail, where we would swim, it wasn't of much use to me. It's hard to even track the river as it twists and turns and obscures itself under buildings, coming out different sizes and sometimes different colors as it winds its way to the harbor. But as it turns out, before Camden was known for its brick buildings and beautiful boats, people were drawn to the area for this small but mighty stream called McGuntcook, and the whole town used to go by the same name. As soon as I joined the select board, I started having to make decisions about all kinds of things that I didn't understand. So I find I'm constantly asking questions like, what are we talking about and why are we doing it? It didn't take long before dams came up on the agenda and I began hearing about all the expenses that go along with them. They need to be inspected, insured, maintained, and adjusted. They cost the town hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so I got to work asking lots of questions about each one. Some of them serve the purpose of maintaining a desirable water level that is elevated for recreational purposes. But some of them, like the town-owned Montgomery Dam, where the river enters the harbor, are today basically aesthetic in their purpose. Wait, what? Since when is a concrete wall in the middle of a river considered beautiful? Okay, people like waterfalls, but it's not the kind of waterfall you see out in nature. It's more like a wildlife border wall that was built for a purpose it no longer serves. Back when water wheels were the main form of power, the dam forced water away from its natural course, which was through the Harbor Park walkway, and into the basement of the Camden Grist Mill, and later to the textile mill and anchor factory on the public landing. Ingenious and purpose-filled at the time, but today it does no such thing, and instead creates a muddy bathtub that is blocking fish from accessing an entire watershed and depriving an entire ecosystem of an essential part of the food web. So while the dam itself may technically belong to the town of Camden, Camden Harbor and the McGonagall River are gateways that connect the Atlantic Ocean to an entire region that is shared by many. Most of us recognize the importance of migratory birds, but what I didn't realize is that migratory fish are actually just as important. Every spring, the river fills with a type of fish called an alewife. Alewives, a kind of herring, are anadromous fish, which means they live in the ocean, but they migrate temporarily into fresh water to spawn. When they return inland after years at sea, they help to complete a cycle that has sustained life for thousands of years, carrying nutrients from the sea back to the land fertilizing the soil, and providing nourishment to everything from otters to ospreys. When dams are installed without fish passage, the natural cycle is broken. Not only are sea run fish prevented from traveling upstream, but species such as native brook trout, which were once abundant, can't move up and down the river as temperatures and conditions change. These fish need cold, well-oxygenated water, with lots of rocky crevices to lay their eggs. When dams hold back water in impoundments, they also trap sediment that smothers the natural stream bottom that the fish depend on. Cold, rocky streams like McGuntacook are slowed down, heated up, and transformed by layers and layers of mud. McGuntacook River still has pockets of highly suitable habitat, but when fish tumble over our dams, they have no way of getting back. When fish can't spawn, 
they can't reproduce, and it didn't take long for the wild population to die out. But what about fish from the sea? Not being a fish expert, I started by listening to a few who promptly told me that they'd never heard of alewives trying to get past the dam in Camden Harbor. But soon, I read a mention of alewives in the Camden Town Meeting Notes from 1806. Sure enough, once I recalibrated my eyes to read 200-year-old cursive, I could see that a request had indeed been made to examine whether the dam owners could be forced to open up sluiceways to allow for the passage of alewives and other fish from the harbor to what was called the large pond above Mullinos Mills. A committee was formed and there was mention of petitioning the state legislature to compel the dam owners to comply, but it appears that nothing came of it in Camden. The first permanent settlers came to McGonagook Harbor in 1769 and got right to work leveraging the river's power by blasting bedrock, damming the flow, and molding the landscape in more ways than have been possible to properly document. The little stream that runs behind the middle school turned water wheels that powered the production of everything from flour, paper, and textiles to anchors, gravestones, and gunpowder. Yes, gunpowder right here in Camden. We don't use the river for power today, but we still need some of the dams to maintain deep water for swimming and boating, and in some places just to fill in for Mother Nature. For example, the two dams at the outlet of the lake that are now owned by the town of Camden used to be owned by the downtown mill owners who used them to regulate the amount of water that was sent downstream to their mills. In the late 1800s when there was a drought and not enough water was flowing, they went so far as to blast the outlet of the lake so they could lower it below its natural limits. Eben Fernald and others living on the lake were furious, and they were even granted an injunction by the Maine Supreme Court. Perhaps unsurprisingly, this had all taken its toll, and by the late 1800s, a state law was passed banning fishing in the entire McGuntacook watershed. One last effort to save dwindling native fish populations and even that didn't work. At that point though, they needed the river for everything from powering mills to washing sewage and sawdust out to sea. So shortly thereafter, the town seems to have given up on wild fish surviving in the lakes and streams on their own at all. A better idea was brewing nationwide. Why not bypass mother nature altogether and raise the fish in tanks and release them where we want them? The town requested a hatchery be funded by the state at the base of McGundacook Lake, and so began the tradition that continues today. The numbers that are desirable by anglers wouldn't be as much if we didn't do our stocking. Favorite part of the job is seeing the expression on those folks' faces when they realize that the fishing all of a sudden just got way better. Stocking is a very important job. What we're doing is essentially giving Mother Nature a boost. We stock about 1.2 million fish a year. So we're creating that opportunity for folks to go out and have a real good chance of catching a fish. And that's what it's all about. From a recreational fishery standpoint, the strategy worked and fishing opportunities were greatly improved but we never have succeeded in restoring the true biodiversity of the river that has given us so much. After going to the Damascata Fish Ladder to look and see all of those fish going up, I came back to Camden, thought maybe I can find some. And the first day I didn't find any, but the second day there were 
at least 100 that I could see with my eyes, alewives trying to swim up, up to the dam. I mean, it was just the most exciting thing that, that has happened to me. We're realizing that these dams that we put in 200 years ago, because that was the only way for us to power our mills, the dams are still here and we've gotten attached to the way they look in some cases, but they're blocking an entire ecosystem from doing what it was originally intended to do. Now is the time to ask ourselves, what do we want Camden to be known for? We have peregrine falcons, osprey, bald eagles, and bobcats. But why do we need the state of Maine to raise our fish in hatcheries when we have dozens of miles of cold, rocky streams perfectly suited for the native populations that used to thrive here all on their own? I believe we should invest in a healthy river that attracts abundant wildlife, in a river that attracts tourists, not with a contrived concrete barricade and artificial waterfall, but a freely flowing river that tumbles over the natural ledge that exists there. What could be more beautiful than that? What could be more beautiful than the return of native fish runs and sustained wild brook trout populations to the McGonagall watershed? What if you could eat your ice cream and peer over this footbridge, not just at ducks and the occasional wayward hatchery fish, but at eagles and ospreys and thousands of native fish heading upstream to spawn. It's happening all across New England as towns, private landowners, and organizations are working to reconnect rivers and streams to the Atlantic Ocean. Fish are returning to places they haven't seen in hundreds of years, and the time is right to finish what the townspeople started here in Camden back in 1806. There is something we need, it's a leap of faith, a step away from the comfort zone and be a little brave, so take a look around you, how far can you see, how far do you think you can run, standing on your own knees, it's a beautiful world out there, just don't pass on the day. reason having trouble getting out of this screen. Um, I don't know. Hallie, I don't know if you can. It's like my computer's sort of frozen up and I can't see um, my there we go. Maybe. I, I think going. I can do something now. Maybe you can click on. Oops. Yes. Um, Stop share, maybe. <laughs> there we go. Oh, there we go. Okay. Oh my gosh. That was frustrating. Um, <laughs> so um, that, um, that was a video that, that I made um, really when we just kind of started um, researching this. Um, and so we've learned a lot since then. And we've also learned that um, you know, there's a massive amount of grant funding available and for this. And some of the reasons for that aren't um, totally apparent. Um, you know, I've learned a lot. But um, Hallie is a student um, at the College of the Atlantic um, studying um, much of um, many things connected to this issue. And she's gonna to try to 
um, give us a little bit more context for how the McGonagall watershed fits into um, the larger region and um, some of the challenges that are being faced in um, the marine environment. Take it away, Hallie. Great, thanks, Allison. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hallie Arno. I am a third year student at College of the Atlantic. Um, I'm studying conservation, ecology, um, and restoration with a focus on fisheries. So I'm really excited to be able to be involved in this project a little bit. Um, I am going to share my screen. Um, awesome. So I just want to take a minute to reflect on some of the longer history of the river because I think that will provide a lot of context about the ecology. Um, so many of us probably learned in high school or, um, that this area was covered in ice, about a mile of ice close to 20,000 years ago, and that was the Laurentide Ice Sheet. Um, then after it retreated, which was about 10,000 years ago, uh, because it was not frozen anymore, fish were able to swim up the river. And because of the presence of the river, likely um, people were attracted to this area, um, the Wabanaki specifically now. Um, and that is because the river provided transportation. Um, it also provided fish, food, uh, fresh water, which was all really important. Um, we actually still use the Wabanaki name for the Maguntukuk, which means great swells of the sea, depending on the exact translation. Um, so there is quite a bit of indigenous history uh, around the river, which I want to make sure to acknowledge. And we still in Camden rely on the river for fish, especially for tourism, um, but also for local enjoyment. However, these fish, um, a lot, not, not just the fish, but the greater ecology of the river, which I'm gonna to touch on later, um, is facing a lot of threats both climate related and also human related. Um, and all of these come together um, at once. So threats like pollution, warming water, um, deoxygenating water all come together and make it really hard for fish to survive, which has ramifications for the entire ecosystem. So I just wanna look over what a watershed is, which we all know, especially after seeing Allison's video, but just wanna throw this up as a reminder that any drop of water from Camden, parts of Lincolnville, parts of Hope will end up in the McGuntacook River. This means that anything that washes in a storm drain from rain um, or salt that's put on the street will almost certainly end up in the McGuntacook River if it doesn't evaporate first. So this is a threat to not only fish, but to all wildlife and potentially even human life and if we had a sewer issue or something like that. So this is just another reason to be aware of the effect we have on the river and the ecology of the river. Um, and it's the pollution is a further threat to fish combined with other climate related factors. For example, warming water. A lot of these fish like brook trout, something that um, are really dear to us because they're a native species and they're a fishery species and a stock species, um, need cool, clear pools of water to um, survive, especially in the summer, this is where they take refuge in these cool and um, rocky pools. So as the climate warms, as the water warms, um, these fish will have less and less habitat in the late summer, and that will lead to higher mortality. And that will also have effects for the ecosystem. Um, other fish called anadromous fish, which Allison talked about in the video, um, are dying more in the ocean. And this is because of fisheries, um, bycatch, things like that, and also warm water in the ocean, ocean acidification, it's this perfect storm. So because more of these anadromous fish are dying in the ocean, that means we need to work really hard to make sure that at least they can spawn because that is really the only way to save the population is to protect the spawning population. If we want to save um, the anadromous fish like alewives, um, elvers, which are an important fishery species and a really economically important species here and are threatened. Um, and a whole suit of other species. There are, I believe, 12 um, important anadromous fish species in the Gulf of Maine. So then what role do we have in resilience of the river? So resilience is being able to um, adapt to changes and not to die because of these changes. And because there are so many threats happening to the fish and other species in this river from warming water to pollution to ocean mortality, um, by protecting the river and making it this safe haven for these species, they'll have a higher chance of survival. Um, you can see this is the Duck Trap River, one that was recently restored and almost all of the land along the Duck Trap is owned by land trusts. Um, so it's a great example of restoration working. 
Um, you can see even just in this picture, the water is flowing quickly, which means it's cooler. Um, there are a lot of trees and plants along the sides, which means that, first of all, um, it shades it, so it keeps it even cooler. It also means that the leaves falling into the water provide nutrients for invertebrates, which then become food for fish. Um, and it also has habitat for birds, um, lots of other species. So these ramifications happen throughout the food chain of restoration. So it's not just fish. And I really want to emphasize that it's not just all of this work for alewives. It's um, all of the ramifications both above the food chain, like birds we love, like eagles and falcons. But it's also um, these fish bring nutrients from the ocean onto the land and they fertilize the soil and they improve the plants. And there's also um, a cultural aspect that we have lost in the Maguntukuk a little bit of that tradition of fishing in the river that the Wabanaki had. Um, so there are a lot of intertwined effects um, and habitat ecological effects of having fish in the river that is more than just seeing some fish. Um, so I really wanna emphasize the food web and ecological impacts which is something that I am studying now. I also wanna emphasize that we aren't the only ones doing this. Um, there's some big rivers like the Penobscot uh, and the Kennebec that are looked at for restoration. Penobscot um, has already gone through significant restoration and uh, seeing more salmon and more seabirds than it has in a very long time. And it's actually potentially becoming a refuge for seabirds. So while Populations of some seabirds in the Gulf of Maine are declining overall, they're increasing in the Penobscot. So they're seeing a whole bloom of biodiversity because of restoration efforts. Um, and there's also been a lot of talk you probably have heard if you read the newspaper about the Kennebec um, and Janet Mills being supportive of fish restoration efforts there because it's really important for Atlantic salmon, which are endangered. Um, and Recently, the Royal River in Yarmouth is also being looked at, but there are tons of small rivers. Uh, the Narragweg is the orange up and down the coast that are also being looked at for restoration. So this is where a lot of others in the state are looking. And I think it's really exciting that right here in Camden, we are going to hoping to be part of that and bring fish back into the river. Thank you. Great, thanks, Hallie. Um, so we're going to um, sort of a, along a, a similar note here, going to um, show a video that was um, produced by um, Mid Coast Conservancy, which is um, an environmental organization um, that has a little bit more um, experience with river restoration and land conservation, certainly a lot more experience than the town of Camden. Um, and um, when we started to look at all of this, we really wanted to um, make sure that we could answer questions in a science-based way and that we had um, some more support and expertise um, because even though the town of Camden owns four of the dams on the McGonagall River, um, river restoration and biology and ecology um, and even sometimes communication is not really um, an area where, you know, the town of Camden has a track record of being able to do a great job all on our own. So um, the grant funding that we've received has helped us to be able to bring on um, Mid Coast Conservancy and um, they um, have, qu have quite a bit of experience. And one of these uh, rivers that they've been working on is the Sheepscot River. And this is just a little video about that. All rivers are. Oh, hold on. Am I sharing my? You aren't. I'm not. Here we go. Let's go. Um, sharing. Important to me. This one is very important to me because I live on it. Every drop of water that falls somewhere on land flows down into the river. And there's a story, and it's cyclical. And everybody has impact. And therefore, we have responsibility. There's a Wabanaki prophecy that says that the new dawn is, it'll happen in the dawn land. Wabanaki territory is the dawn land. What I think changed minds of people along the Sheepscot was the understanding that we really do have a national treasure here. It's a small coastal river but it's incredibly biodiverse. We have all 12 sea run fish species in the river, which is rare. 
We think immediately of Atlantic salmon. They're the king predator of fish. Rainbow smelt, sea run brook trout, uh, Atlantic sturgeon, tomcod, short nose sturgeon. Okay, wait, let me try again. Certainly the one we've been, so far at least, the most successful has been river herring, both bluebacks and alewives. But shad would have come up this river in massive numbers. Stripers are coming up now in pretty good numbers and picking off the young alewives. The elvers are in this river. They have come back from the Sargasso Sea and they will then go back. And when we get more lampreys up this river, who spawn and then their bodies decompose and all of those nutrients go filtering down through the column and the crayfish are there picking them off. And the bass are eating the crayfish and the mink are eating the crayfish and the otters are eating the crayfish. You know, it's all linked. When mussels are larvae, when they're in their early life stage, they actually hook on to the gills of fish. And so they take a ride and that's how they're able to disperse themselves. If you think of a river like an artery, the fish are a lot like blood cells that carry the nutrients up and down the river. So we are connected to everything. They're connected to each other as species. We are connected to the river as humans. And I remember really clearly once standing on a bridge looking for my first alewife run. And I looked down in the water and there was nothing going on. You know, it was just black. And then all of a sudden one of the fish rolled and I realized that what I was looking at was fish, bank to bank, top to bottom. That's what we're supposed to see. People's first interest in the river was thinking of it as a source of food, secondly, as a source of power, to run their grist mills and their fulling mills and their sawmills. It wasn't for a hundred years or more that they realized that they were preventing a lot of fish from getting where they needed to go in order to have more fish. My grandparents, when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, they had not seen in their lifetime what this river was capable of. There are a lot of towns like Whitefield that have old dams like this that were built a couple hundred years ago, and a lot of them are degrading. The dam was leaking severely, and this time of year, with the low flow out of the river, our hydrant was out of water. The town really didn't want to spend a lot of money fixing up the dam. And so it's like, so where do we go from there? The partners really hosted a variety of meetings with the town, uh, the community, with the select board, with the fire department. And we held these meetings monthly for a couple of years to really start from the bottom up. And we went in with no preconceived notion. We had the goal of reestablishing connectivity and creating fish passage, working through that process together to arrive at, a, at the solution that we all felt confident in was really the critical piece to making this project successful. Because Cooper's Mills Dam was a sought after dam removal project for decades. I think timing was important, but also that the fact that we did start from the bottom and worked our way up. There's a lot of questions, a lot of answers, and uh, we finally put it all together and, and went to the townspeople and said, uh, this, is, this is the best we, we're going, going to have, I think. Right. You know, the alternative was to uh, let the dam fall down. Then we'd have nothing. We would have nothing. We would have a dry riverbed or a riverbed like we see right now that uh, had no way of getting water out of. Before the dam came out, uh, Cooper's Mills always had a, a dry hydrant intake in the impoundment. Uh, so we designed in two pools to make sure they'd always have one here. And that was the, the bottom line for the town. And yep leaving parts of the dam on the overlook so that there was that connection to the past and it wasn't just completely taken away. Right, there was a lot of thought in that. I mean, yeah. the, uh, the people that were developing this site took that all into consideration. They worked with that historical society yeah. Yeah. too. And they um, listened to the people in the village. Yep. For many years, this dam was really seen as a nuisance and it was extremely unsafe. And by improving the site and removing the unsafe assets, we were able to turn that on its head and able to allow people to now access the river. We actually had a lot of fun over the last year of being on the edges of this massive construction project at the Head Tide Dam because it didn't take out the whole dam as it, the Cooper's Mills. It modified an existing dam. 
I used to walk down to the bottom of the hill here and look down into a pool where all the alewives had come all the way up from the ocean ready to get all the way up to spawning ground and they were just masked there because they couldn't go any further because the water coming through the little holes in the dam was just too strong for them. You know, there was no question there was lots of tension about the change that we were advocating for. And yet when we finally compromised and found a solution that will allow fish to go upriver at least 90% of the days when they want to move. They're going to run through there. I can't wait to see it. It's the most exciting thing. You're going to be able to stand on a platform and look down and watch them. Hopefully we'll see shad go through. But that's actually why the uh, grate that is at head tide is open like that, is to convince the shad that it's just uh, branches up above and they won't be nervous about passing under there because they have been notoriously nervous about concrete and so forth. In the spring every year, I call it the Kevlar hatch. It's when all the kayaks and the canoes are high enough water to come down from King's Mills and come through right to head tide. This year, they'll be able to go right on through. And so there's another migration that might be happening. Some people and part of this reconstruction project also provided a safe place for them to pull out because it used to be a little dicey at times. Not only that, but there's a swimming hole here, which is the other reason I'm glad the dam stayed, because it scoured out a, a deep swimming hole that's been part of people that I know whose grandfathers lived here who used to swim in that swimming hole. So we, <laughs> we have preserved that for the kids, and for the adults too, for that matter. My grandchildren have always swum in the river. A couple of them learned to swim there, in fact. They swim with a snapping turtle that's about a foot and a half long. And every once in a while we see her. In fact, one year she came out of the river and up to my garden and laid her eggs in my beet row. Those kinds of things, I think, anchor us. You know, they give, they give our lives meaning, they give us context. The river belongs to us all, and we all should be able to not only use it, but then if we do use it, we then learn to respect it. We completed the project just two years ago, but the ecosystem is responding so strongly. And I could see it days after we breached the dam and we were able to remove the dam completely. I was able to watch juvenile alewife that had spawned in ponds upstream move down with ease. Within a year after removing the dam, we saw more Atlantic salmon reds above this area than we had ever seen before. I think this restoration project is the kind of thing that can give young people hope because you see, if you give nature a chance, she can come back in such a strong way. It took a lot of people. It took a lot of imagination. It took a lot of effort. Uh, a lot of belief. There were many times that people were ready to give up. It took money. It will always take money. <laughs> It'll always take people who care. And I think it's a work of a lifetime to be proud of. Okay, so, um, so far we've covered a lot of the um, wildlife and habitat reasons for looking at um, river restoration. But um, there's another aspect of all of this, which is a huge part of the reason why Camden um, is uh, so eligible for so much funding. And that's the climate change part of it. Um, because of the fact that um, Camden is known to face um, rising sea levels and also um, more extreme rain events, this puts us in a category of um, being able to receive funding for a lot of um, solutions that actually sort of tie into dam removal. And so over the past five years or so, the Watershed School 
has been um, doing its best to educate town government um, and officials about the role of climate change and the type of planning that needs to happen in um, this area. And so Hallie's gonna give us, um, and maybe Caleb too, I'm not sure if Caleb's gonna be um, doing this, you guys can decide, but um, just a basic overview of what we can expect um, here in Camden in terms of climate change, sort of what is known and what is um, not known and just the types of things that we need to be planning for. Awesome, thanks Allison. Yeah, so I graduated Watershed in 2018 um, and was working on some sea level rise mapping during my time there. And if you have any questions about that, please feel free to reach out to me or Caleb, who's doing a lot of that work now. Um, but I'm gonna, so I already talked about the effects on wildlife. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit, a bit about the effects on humans. Um, here we go. So because of climate change, Midcoast Maine will be seeing more rain. And I hear a lot of people say, when is climate change going to happen? And it already is. So we're already seeing the effects of climate change on Camden. Um, this is some data from Maine Water Company showing how we're already seeing an increase in precipitation and that trend is expected to continue. So that means we're going to have more extreme floods, um, maybe potentially more drainage issues um, and it is going to have an effect on the town. And we're actually uniquely situated to have even more rain than most. So you can see these coastal counties um, are expected, have already seen a higher change in rain. Um, so this is from 1961 to 2008, the change um, in a hundred year precipitation event. So this isn't, this one back here is just the inches of rain. Um, this one here is how many storms we are having. So this means that we're having a lot more rain and it's a lot more concentrated, um, which is, can be problematic, especially um, in places that are susceptible to flooding. Um, so we can see the effects of this on the lake. It could flood roads. Um, here, this is the south end of the Cook boat launch. Um, and the uh, lake level is really high. Um, part of that is because the dams are holding back a lot of that water that otherwise would be able to quickly be flushed out to the ocean to mitigate some of this flooding. Here is another image um, of the Knox Mill Dam. Uh, and it's a problem for the buildings, all of this flooding. And that also means that all of that paint and salt from the road is being washed into the river. So further pollution um, and problems for people as well. Um, this is another potential flood image and I hope we won't see more of these in the future, but it looks like we will based on the data. So that's the thing that we really need to plan for as a town. Um, along with that, we also are getting a sea level rise. Um, so we're sort of getting flooded from both sides. Um, and sea level rise is already happening um, everywhere, but especially in the Gulf of Maine, because our waters are warming faster, that means that there are also ex thermal expansion um, is causing sea level rise. So we're especially susceptible here in Camden. I'm sure everybody's seen the benches flood in the park at high tide. Um, and this is especially problematic when the river is um, already at a high water level and flooding. Um, because this sort of double water from both sides exacerbates the flooding um, and runs into Harbor Park. This also means that the seawall is, as sure you've all walked by recently and seen that it needs some work and some help. Um, it's beginning to be a potential safety hazard. I'm sure if you've seen kids climbing on it, the rocks don't look super stable right now. Um, but because of a potential for dam removal or river rerouting that would also affect the seawall that needs to be um, reworked anyway. So I think Allison will talk about that a bit more in her presentation, but I just wanted to touch on how some of the effects of climate change will be specific to Camden and what we are going to see in the future. Okay, um, great, go ahead and share my screen here. Um, and basically just get into a little bit of the um, details of what we're looking at um, and the scope of the grant funding that we've received so far and where we are in that process. 
Um, just a quick overview of um, the McGonnacook River watershed. It um, contains 1,500 acre McGonnacook Lake, um, also Norton Pond, Moody Pond. Um, it's about 33 square miles. Um, it's comprised mostly of Camden and um, Lincolnville, about half of a little over half of McGonnacook Lake is actually in Lincolnville. Um, also part of the part, a little bit of Hope is um, in the McGonnacook watershed and also a little bit of Sears Mon. Um, the, in terms of dams, there are a total of seven dams of um, various purposes and sizes in between the lake and um, Camden Harbor. Four of them are owned by the town of Camden. Um, the others are privately owned. None of them currently have um, fish passage of, of any kind. Um, so a lot of what sparked um, the most recent round of conversations on dams and possible alternatives was um, the need for some repairs on Montgomery Dam. And so about uh, three years ago, there had been some money budgeted to um, improve this spillway and make it a little bit more even so that the water would cascade more evenly. And um, the bids for that project came back um, over budget. And at that same time, um, I, when it came up on a select board agenda, we got a, a fair amount of community input saying, hold on, you know, what, what is this dam? What's its purpose? And um, you know, has the town looked at the alternatives um, and sort of what the ecological cost of, of the status quo might be and whether there's anything else we should do. So we did a study, um, a really detailed study actually of the dam and that's available on the Camden Town website. Um, but basically what it found um, is that the, the role of the dam has changed over the years. Um, it used to be power producing in a variety of ways, just from turning a water wheel to also a small hydropower project. Um, but that at this point it's um, you know, maintained for aesthetic reasons. Um, I think we've all probably seen um, or in, you know, enjoyed that view ourselves or seen others enjoying it. Um, it sort of creates this, uh, makes this waterfall effect over the ledge here, um, you know, significantly more dramatic. Um, but basically the study found um, that removal of the dam would um, significantly reduce the risk of flooding to buildings in the immediate vicinity. So it would shrink that um, FEMA flood zone, which is what the um, you know, flood insurance rates are based off of. Um, it would also reduce long-term um, cost of operation and maintenance to the town. Um, currently we employ a dam control agent that um, checks the dams daily and sometimes in cases of storms hourly. Um, the Montgomery Dam takes two people to operate. So it needs to be um, closed most of the time in order to preserve that sort of waterfall cascading effect. But when we get a significant amount of rain, it needs to be opened in order to not um, flood those buildings. So sometimes that happens on the weekends, sometimes at night. Um, and you know, it takes, it takes a lot of staff time um, to sort of check on that. And um, it can also be a safety risk sometimes. Um, it also found that dam removal would provide the greatest opportunities for ecological restoration, but um, also clearly the largest amount of change to an area um, that is really beloved for, for many reasons. Um, you know, Harbor Park, um, these businesses, there are you know, many ab abutting properties and interests. And um, you know, it's always hard when you have to look at changing um, you know, something that people already like so much. Um, we got um, a lot of public input and sort of from all sides of this, but there was definitely a strong desire to study the rest of the watershed. Um, people had a lot of questions about whether there was any kind of um, toxicity concerns for the sediment upstream, um, wanted to know whether it would be possible to restore fish passage all the way up to the lake, what would that mean? Would it mean all the dams have to be removed? What are, you know, what are the options? And so um, in order to be able to inform this conversation a little bit better, um, it was um, it thought to be a, a good thing to understand the rest of the watershed a little better. Um, 
And so we'll just um, one of the things that wasn't on some of our radar when we initially started studying the dam was just how much dams um, impact the flood zone. And so this here just kind of shows the um, bubble around the dams. And you can kind of think about it, some dams um, are designed for the purpose of flood protection, you know, to keep water, you know, massive amount of water from being able to reach an area. Um, the dams uh, throughout the McGonagall watershed were constructed largely in order to be able to store water in impoundments so that it could then be released to power a water wheel um, at the necessary time. So there was a time when they would actually turn off the water up at the lake during the night and then turn it on in the morning and let it, um, you know, let it rush down um, into the into the downtown so that it could be used you know, much like electricity used when it was needed. And so um, it's a lot like having like a, you know, each of these dams, it's a lot like having a full bathtub in your um, in your bathroom. And if you keep the bathtub full all the time and then um, anything happens or you turn on the water really fast, it, it increases um, the likelihood that your bathroom will flood. And so that's a little bit what we have with some of these dams um, in, in the downtown. Um, a lot of funding available um, for projects that would reduce our, um, you know, the flood risk to the town. Um, so, also, um, we want to. One of the the questions we've gotten a lot is, you know, are are you talking about removing, you know, all the dams, or what would this do to, um, you know, my water level on Norton Pond or McGonagall Lake? And um, it's really important to emphasize that only some of the dams are even being evaluated for removal. Um, the ones. Um, that are in yellow here are the ones that are being looked at for um, possible removal to understand what the implications would be and you know the different ways that that could be des designed. The ones in green here are the ones that are under no circumstances even being um, considered for removal. So you have um, these two dams, the east and west McGonagall Lake dams are the ones that um, are, they control the level of the water on McGonagall Lake and Norton Pond. And they're the only dams that influence that. Um, and they are being studied for, for fish passage options only, like a, a fish ladder or a fish passage of some sort that could go around the dams, um, much like Dam Roscata Lake, for instance. Um, then we have the, another town-owned dam, which is the Seawright Dam, also not being evaluated for removal because that one, um, there's you know, a lot of waterfront property here. People swim at, at shirt tail. Um, this is really sort of considered more of a pond or um, a small lake at this point. So that controls the water level um, all the way from the Seawright Dam back to about the Molino Road Bridge. So definitely not being considered for removal um, at all. Um, the the most significant grant funding we've received so far is from the National Coastal Resilience Fund, about $139,000 to do um, a comprehensive plan that the town can use to address fish passage and watershed connectivity barriers, flooding hazards, vulnerable infrastructure, integrated stream and wetland habitat in the water. Um, again, this isn't at the point where it is um, gonna lead us to any immediate decisions. It's just helping us to understand um, the broader context of the watershed and what um, some of the opportunities or challenges might be at different sites. Um, this is the annual um, report from uh, 2006, which, oh, whoops, um, which covers a lot of the events that happened in 2005 and um, basically just gives a good overview of the reason why we are eligible for some of um, this funding because um, there were, if anybody remembers, there were, some, there were major floods in, in 2005. It wasn't even a, a hundred year storm event, but um, it, it created a lot of issues. Washed out and if the force with which the water came out in the harbor um, from the river, knocked out our float system, knocked down the seawall in one place, um, all kinds of things. So um, as, you know, as wonderful as it would be to be able to study everything and know everything about the watershed before we move forward on you know, anything at all, um, we have also had to come to the realization that 
some aspects of all of this um, may not be able to wait. Um, the seawall is one example of um, something that's connected to, you know, the Montgomery Dam is really the only dam that is affected by um, sea level rise in any way. And that's because of the fact that it's tied in to um, the seawall here. And so as um, we've realized that this overtopping of the seawall is actually happening a lot more than um, was realized. It's happening something like four to eight times um, a month. And we've been doing a lot of documenting of that. It's degrading very, very fast. And so um, we may be in a situation where we are forced to make an investment um, before, um, you know, before we really feel ready or settled on a solution. So we also applied, um, you can see here, this is a, a good example of how um, decisions about the dam and what would happen here are really intertwined with um, the seawall. And it would be very difficult to modify the dam significantly without also making some changes um, to the seawall. At the same time, um, the seawall is a victim of, of sea level rise and there's really no scenario where something doesn't have to um, change there. So um, this just shows a few more pictures of the submersion and this shows a little bit what Hallie was talking about, what happens when we get really high tide events and um, there's a lot of water coming off of the river, it basically causes the, the river to sort of start shooting out into Harbor Park as well. Um, so um, we got $40,000 um, in a technical assistance grant from the Maine um, Coastal Program and $10,000 from the Island Institute in order to combine what we've learned from the Montgomery Dam Feasibility Study with the urgent need to repair um, or reimagine the seawall. Um, and so that's, there are basically two grants that are happening um, that we have at the same time and they're on somewhat parallel tracks. The um, one additional complicating um, factor is that Harbor Park is controlled by the um, Camden Public Library Board of Trustees. And so um, anything that affects Harbor Park at all also needs the support of the Library Board of Trustees. And um, if you know Camden as a town isn't known for moving um, really fast on things with town government, it can take us a long time to reach consensus. But when you start to involve you know, many different you know, property owners, multiple different boards, um, we have a fair amount of, of work to do. And so we've been working with the library to determine um, you know, what the best way of going forward with public input on um, the Montgomery Dam project is. Um, and we're gonna have a series of conversations just specifically related to the Montgomery Dam um, as well, because we know that's an area of significant interest. Um, so basically a um, lot of funding available for things if they can both restore habitat and reduce our risk of funding. And so um, we're actually in a really great place um, if we can do that. Coastal resilience is a term that's being used a lot. Um, a lot of this funding that is available to us comes from NOAA. Um, they define coastal resilience as um, building the ability of a community to bounce back after hazardous events such as hurricanes, coastal storms, and flooding rather than simply reacting to the impacts. So um, for us, that means kind of designing things to be less likely to flood or also just designed to flood without causing um, a major problem rather than waiting for it to happen and then trying to fund um, rebuilding. Um, the National Coastal Resilience Fund is where um, we have this assessment grant funding, that's the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation in partnership with um, NOAA. And so um, they, they have funded this broad watershed level assessment feasibility study. But the idea of that is that it doesn't just stop there, um, that there are three different categories. First, they will fund um, broad assessments and then also, um, design and engineering in the next phase, and then also construction. And so the hope is that with this first step, we can get to the point where we can identify a couple of sites that would make sense um, to do more detailed design and engineering on, and um, you know, then move forward with 
that. So they give millions of dollars away um, every year. Um, the, this is just sort of an example of some of the types of things that NOAA and the National Fish and Wildlife um, Foundation would like you know, communities to be considering where possible. Um, more shorelines that are more natural and less reliant on man-made infrastructure like concrete, um, with the idea being that they are, um, they're more resilient and that they also create a lot better habitat. Um, so that is the same thing. Basically now I'm just gonna go through um, an overview of each of the dams quickly. I know that's one of the barriers that um, we face even on the select board, just knowing, okay, which dam is which, what does it do and um, who owns it so that we can all sort of be talking about the same thing as we move forward. Um, that's all that. Oh, actually I forgot. Um, this is just a quick thing to show um, what our, our dam control agent often faces during um, these flooding events. Um, he goes to the lake. The big um, concern is making sure that we keep the lake levels at sort of an acceptable um, level all the time. And there's a policy that was developed about where it should be at each um, stage in the season. Um, but sometimes what happens despite the best efforts is it, it will either get too low or it will um, raise much faster than anyone anticipates. And so when that happens, you have to let a lot of water out quickly from the lake um, in order to not flood properties and septic systems and all of that stuff. The result of that is that um, it can cause way too much water to come downtown really fast. And so um, the threat that we face is not, not just because of increased precipitation, but increased extreme storm events where lots and lots of water is rushing through the watershed um, all at once. And ultimately, you know, every drop of water that falls in you know, many parts of Lincolnville and Camden ultimately has to pass in between the Knox Mill buildings underneath um, the Smiling Cow um, and all these places. So this um, just shows not even a 10 year storm event. This is this was not out of the ordinary at all. This was um, you know, just last year where um, you, know, you just got so much water in the lake, but the more water you let out, um, it's, it's just starting to flood other things. And so finding opportunities within the watershed to soak up a little bit more um, water by you know, removing some sediment and wetlands or restoring um, uh, floodplains is, is what this grant is all aimed at um, doing. The other part is the habitat restoration part. Um, we've spent a lot of time documenting the different species down in the harbor that are trying to make it up into the river. Um, one of the things that's been really interesting for me to see is that it's not just these um, you know, river herring and typical marine species that, um, that I'm seeing trying to get into the um, you know, river like alewives and river herring. That was exciting to see those. But it's also um, the, the brook trout, even just the ones that are you know, stocked by inland fisheries and wildlife, a lot of them end up tumbling over the dams and then they get stuck in the harbor. And um, you know, like these, these two here, it was, it's really sad to see them trying so, so hard to get back into the river and um, then they can't. Um, this was, these are all just species that have been observed right in, in the harbor, rainbow smelts. Um, this seal here uh, was chasing um, some blueback herring one night. We see a lot of tom cod. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to uh, mention is uh, that one of the additional reasons why Camden is is really eligible for some of this stuff is that it's seen as one of the um, one of the best opportunities for restoring um, a fish run in an urban area. So um, people flock to, to Dare Mascata Mills sort of in the middle of nowhere and huge numbers. And um, the opportunity for people to be able to interact with wildlife and see um, fish you know, fighting off the falls in Camden Harbor, um, it would be a really unique experience for, for people to be able to see that um, at the same time as they can go and you know get something to, to eat at one of the shops or go to a show at the opera house, 
most places where you have to travel to see um, an alewife run are you know kind of in the middle of nowhere and you have to bring your own sandwich. Um, so these spring migrations um, do kind of coincide with a, with a time of year when it's slightly, the, the tourism um, hasn't quite picked up yet in Camden. And so we, we would really like to explore you know, what opportunities might be there. Um, just quickly, just to show everybody, East and West Dam, owned by the town of Camden, um, used to be a, a grist mill and a sawmill, also a fish hatchery and a number of other things, gifted by the town, uh, uh, gifted by the McGonagall Watershed Association to the town of Camden um, years ago and um, funded by Camden taxpayers with the help of Lincolnville. Um, whoops. Um, the, this is the Seabright Dam, which is owned by um, also the town of Camden, it used to be a hydropower dam, um, doesn't produce power anymore for a variety of reasons. It was not at all um, financially sustainable. Um, this is another one definitely not being considered for any kind of removal. Um, you know, it controls the water level all the way back to Molino Road. Um, probably one of the easiest ones to maybe achieve um, fish passage for, um, that just is a historical photo. Then we have uh, dam ruins or the powder mill dam. Um, it's called different things on different maps. Um, it's being assessed to see whether it's a full or partial fish passage barrier. It's privately owned. Um, it's on the one on Mount Batty Street behind Shepherd Storage. Um, that's being looked at for, for possible full or partial removal. Um, this is the area behind the, the middle school and the wastewater treatment plant that might have the best opportunity for, um, you know, has some of the, the most sediment accumulated, um, but also the sort of the biggest opportunity for what sediment removal and channel restoration might be able to do um, to, to its ability to soak up water back here having a lot of trouble being able to figure out where the river walk could go. It dead ends over here right now. Um, so this area is all maintained at a slightly higher level um, because of the Knowlton Street Dam. So this area of influence goes really almost all the way back to the Rasenav Bridge, not quite. Um, and uh, it has a, you know, the most sediment trapped in it. Um, this is the, the Knowlton Street Dam that I was just uh, talking about. That's a privately owned dam. Um, it used to be a foundry um, and a number of other things. Uh, the Knox Mill Dam is another privately owned dam. Um, and its area of influence is, even though it's a, a little bit taller than the Knowlton Street Dam, it only impacts the water level from about here to here. Um, because the grade is already so steep um, here. So it's actually almost like a, you know, a little bit of a natural falls throughout part of that, even without the dam. Um, and then this of course is the Montgomery Dam, which is owned by the town of Camden, um, sort of in conjunction with the library in a lot of ways because of Harbor Park. Um, and um, basically over the summer, they did Interflu, which is the, as well as Gartley and Dorsky some, um, and the company's hired to do um, structural and ecological assessments throughout the watershed. They did um, like topographic and infrastructure surveys, geomorphic assessments and sediment sampling. Um, just a few examples of different parts of the river. Um, and one of the biggest, most important parts of this from a planning perspective um, for us was the sediment sampling. Um, Luckily, what we found, you know, they did significant sampling. And what they found is that there haven't been um, toxicity concerns of like a human toxicity um, level concern. Basically, what we're seeing is the same kind of background levels that we see in the harbor. Um, there are a couple places that need to be evaluated a little bit more, but um, you know, like the chromium concerns and all of that that people have been asking about. There is some chromium um, present, but it is. Um, not the, it's not hexavalent chromium, which is the, you know, the toxic one that you hear about from tanneries. It's um, trivalent chromium, which is, is, is really great news. Um, so that 
um, we'll, all of this will be part of a, a detailed report from Interfluve at the end, but that is just sort of an update on what we found so far. Um, they've also just done lots of, as part of their grant, it needs, they need to evaluate the change in the flood zone that would happen if there was full or partial removal at any of these dams, um, potentially could have a really big impact on people's flood insurance rates if we're able to reduce some of that. Um, this just shows, um, you know, an example of, of one part of town um, that people are used to seeing flooded um, due to a dam. And um, you know, this is what the Knox Mill Dam impoundment area looked like on that first day when they opened it up in order to be able to do the assessment. Um, and it was normally, you know, the Montgomery Dam looks pretty bad because there's a lot of a lot of sediment trapped behind there that hasn't been removed. And um, understandably, there are a lot of aesthetic concerns. This one was pretty interesting because it, um, even with the, some of the mud still over the rocks, you could really see a lot of cool geologic features um, and kind of this natural rippling river that just kind of came through there. Um, and um, yeah, that is uh, about it. There is, I wanna point everybody to uh, the Mid Coast Conservancy um, webpage, which has the ability to sign up for updates um, on any of, of this stuff. but. Um, now I basically we want to just sort of stop sharing my screen and um, I know that was a, a lot of information um, that we threw at you. Um, the opportunity for commenting is um, definitely right now, but this is not the only opportunity for commenting. Um, this is going to kind of help us craft the next steps, what we hear from you, but you can also um, send emails. Um, to to me to the select board um, to Mid Coast Conservancy. Um, this is really just the start of a conversation. So feel free to ask or say anything connected to any of this right now. Can also put things um, into the chat here um, if you want. I see um, one question about the slides. And yes, that's definitely all the presentation slides can certainly be made available. Um. Um, hi, Sue Fleming here. Can you hear me? Yes. yes, yes. Um, I just want to thank you for all the wonderful work you all have done. I've been kind of keeping an eye on your posts and I'm just very impressed and I hope this can go forward um, in a positive direction. It's very, very well done with lots of thought. And I love Denver Scott and Mills, so I'm a big supporter. Um, I just had a quick question about what happened last fall at McGunnacook Lake got so, so low while the river was higher than normal. And I just, was that due to the dam thing that they were fooling around with or why did, I know it was a dry summer too, but yeah. how, how how did the river stay so high versus the lake got lower than normal? Right, so um, there were two things going on there. One was you know, extreme drought. So many lakes were facing the same situation, but there was also um, a, a significant sort of hole or a faulty gate on the West McGonagall Lake Dam. And so that um, prevented, you know, normally that would have been able to be closed up just a little bit more um, that has since been repaired. Um, if I had more more photos I, or more time, I would show you all the the photos that um, we took of that. Um, but that's been been repaired. We do have there are minimum flow requirements from the lake all the time. So sometimes people will say, "Well, why don't you just close up the dam completely, and so that you can let the lake um, rise?" We cannot do that um, because that would just completely turn off the river um, downstream. But yeah, that was it. The lake should start to slowly come up. It did after the dam was repaired. Um, this was about a $120,000 repair or so. Um, that, and that, you know, that was the gate on the West Dam um, that the, the lake was able to come up some, 
Um, one of the questions I got recently was why, you know, why even after the winter, is it still seeming to be lower than typical for this time of year? And um, what Dave Bolstridge, the dam control agent explained to me is that um, he was only able to, um, to, to let the lake rise up until the, um, it completely iced over, that it's not good to, um, you know, after it's all iced over, you can't just allow it to keep going up and up and up because you do need to maintain some kind of steady um, level there, but that now that the ice is um, coming out, he's able to close that up more. Actually, just a few days ago, I noticed a significant decrease in the flow um, downtown. Um, and so that was, he's, you know, said that's part of it. So that's a long, sort of a long winded answer. Oh, thank you, though. I've heard conflicting things and I heard there was a leak and then I heard there wasn't a leak. So right. I was <laughs> curious. Yeah. Thank you, Allison. Yeah. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Allison, um, when when are you um, when are you guys thinking of doing the Montgomery Dam uh, meetings? I, I heard you mention something like that with yeah, with the plans for the Montgomery Dam. Um, yeah, so I think the the that is not yet. There's nothing scheduled right now. The plan was to try to you should um, somebody should be reaching out to you from um, Mid Coast Conservancy or maybe Gartley and Dorsky too. Um, the we did this sort of discussing some things with the library um, to figure out how much they wanted the seawall to be included or not included in um, some of the planning. But then the hope um, now is to also do a little bit more outreach to um, people like you to see if there are things that Gartley and Dorsky's um, looking at some of the structural considerations for any of this, um, like the supports on the buildings. Um, I know some people feel like, oh, they, they're you know, designed to be underwater. And so they look, you know, in some cases really bad. Um, you know, what would the options be if we could include, um, you know, if it ever did get to the point where everybody was on board or the majority could vote for something, is there, um, are there structural improvements to those buildings that could be rolled into the grant that we apply for? Or what would um, change if the, if the size of that impoundment changed? Um, would that create opportunities maybe for some building owners to be able to build or not build? Or so you should um, be, the, the yeah, people in that immediate vicinity should be hearing from, um, uh, I, th I think from Shri relatively. Yes, I, I almost recommend like a, a, a group meeting with a lot of those business owners, mm -hmm. property owners above the Montgomery Dam. We, because we, all of us have like certain ideas and we could bounce ideas off one another and work with the town so that I, it's obvious that we need to make a change and, and we could move forward faster if everyone is on the same page. And mm -hmm. I think that would be a great start. Rather, so rather than, um, I rather think, than having somebody reach out individually that may be organizing something where you guys could all be there at the same time. I think all of that is good. Okay. Um, and the Harbor Landing and Harbor Park and the waterfall, it seems like it's all one, you know? Mm -hmm. I just want to make that point. It's almost like you can't make a decision on one without the other. For example, say a footbridge. I've always been opposed to the footbridge because of the landing. I mean, you look at the landing and it's just, you know, the landing, it needs so much work, the asphalt. Mm -hmm. And then you have Harbor Park and it's, you know, beautiful and the waterfall. It's like, you can't put a footbridge on the landing. Mm -hmm. with the way it looks but if we could do one big project and make it right there's so much potential and we, those are things that you know we need to sit down and discuss because I think we all could reach an agreement on many things and move forward on this because I, I don't think we could wait much longer on a lot of these issues that we have mm -hmm. but just a, a thought 
I do think that probably makes a lot of sense. And we haven't, we've kind of had little, you know, conversations with, with this property owner and this property owner, and this property owner and different, um, that it would probably be better to have all, you know, lots of people there at once. Um, and that's great feedback. And um, I will definitely pass that along. I don't, I mean, there's really no reason why that can't happen. Um, right. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Allison, it looks like there's a question in the chat. Um, is there a concern about erosion under the buildings if the dam is removed? Yeah, so um, the one of the things that was done as part of the initial feasibility study um, was to assess the amount of sediment that is um, contained underneath those buildings. Um, and it's, uh, um, you know, the amount of sediment changes in different places. Um, in most cases, they were able to assess um, that the buildings are on, um, you know, we know where the ledge is, basically. There's a lot of ledge right there. And so most of the um, building footings are right on um, bedrock. And so they won't be impacted, but um, it won't be sort of impacted by any erosion. Generally for these types of projects, especially when there is um, not very much um, sediment and there's, because the Montgomery Dam is a relatively, it creates a relatively small impoundment. Normally what we would do is you, you'd remove all of that um, sediment. That would improve the aesthetic appeal too. So it wouldn't just sit there, um, but that, it may be that it's for some of the buildings, some of the sediment that is kind of trapped all around um, those pilings is playing like a supporting role a little bit. Some of the buildings are in better condition than others. And so that's part of what, um, as, as part of this grant, Gartley and Dorsky is doing um, basically additional structural evaluations um, to be able to answer the the question a little bit more thoroughly, but, but probably that sediment would all be removed. And what you'd see is basically just ledge, um, you know, similar to, to what you see on the other sides of the dam. There was um, a small toxicity concern for the sediment in part of the dam. There's like an old storage tank that is not known exactly what it was, but they did find slightly elevated levels of mercury um, there. So that, a lot of that should probably be, be removed anyway. A lot of trash gets stuck down there. Um, about 20 years ago, the town did do a little bit of sediment removal um, just because it was getting trapped in the gate and impacting the ability to turn, open the gate um, or close it. Um, but yes, that's a great question. And um, the other thing that was looked at and is, is whether the impact of any additional ice formation um, could impact the buildings. Um, so that's, there, there's a lot, there's a lot to it. And at first I didn't understand, you know, okay, why does a structural engineer have to look at all of this and all of this? And, um, you know, why haven't there been drawn, one of the frustrations is, you know, why haven't there been drawings yet for the, for the Montgomery Dam? And we do have, um, some you know initial drafts that are um, sort of ready to be shared, but the engineers really like to be sure that everything that they share um, is accurate and that it could actually happen. And so there's just such a, you know, a level of, of engineering that needs to happen because there's so many buildings impacted by that in particular dam. It's kind of a long-winded rambling response, but Mon Montgomery Dam is definitely the most complicated of the, um, of the sites. Um, let's see, anything else? Bob shaking his head, nothing else. Um, I don't know, Bob, you want to expand a little on anything you. Yeah, I, I do. I think um, 
Uh, Tom, I, I love your comments. Um, uh, I think um, or underscore that um, the town is under, clearly understands the need for, well, not the least of which some visuals so we can all understand what we're talking about and we're driving for that. But the, you hit on a point which, to my mind, talks about a master plan. Uh, basically, the landing, the bridges, the the dam, the um, the uh, waterfront of the uh, of the harbor at the um, uh, at the library, um, they're all interconnected. So we, we are will be developing a master plan. Look at that. Uh, the execution of that master plan can be a bit of a challenge because a lot of these elements of, are tied to funding. Uh, not the least of which is the timing of grants. Um, it's also logistic uh, because our landing that the town owns is connected to private property that is immediately adjacent. And I, for one, don't, <laughs> don't want to see stairs on our landing if we affect sea rises to landing, but it can be certainly executed in phases and have a, a vision of what it's all coming to. Uh, I agree with your point completely. It's a, it's, I think it's great to excite the town to uh, look, see, eventually see what the plan, master plan is, where we're going with all of this at this, this beautiful asset called our harbor. Um, um, you know, there's an old thing about if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, the dam is broke, we need to fix it. Uh, more importantly, we can improve it. And that, that's, the, that's the major objective here. And I appreciate your comments very much. You're muted, Tom. You know, I'm an advocate for change, but change in Camden is, you know, it's very sensitive. It's, we have a good thing and we just, I think we need to fun, we need to focus on improvements and maintaining. And I've seen over the years with the Montgomery Dam, you know, there's been basically zero maintenance with that dam. And if we would have, it was gifted to the town. And I know before it was gifted to the town, it was taken care of better because I remember as a kid, there was always a pool of water and a beautiful waterfall. And the Harbor Park still basically looks the same because it's been maintained. Um, and it's held up. I, so I'm, really reluctant or skeptical when the town comes up with ideas of boardwalks and bridges and developing and now fish ladders because I know that you know Allison's got these great ideas and as long as she's part of it I know it will be maintained but once she's gone is it going to be maintained because we haven't maintained what we have. So, you know, that's where I stand. And, you know, Camden is really special and we need to preserve what we have for the next generation. And whatever we do, we need to make sure that it's something that we'll be able to uphold another 100, 200 years. If it's a footbridge, it darn well better be stoned so that, you know, there's going to be very little maintenance because I don't think we're going to be able to put the money into it and maintain things the way they should be. So whenever we consider all these plans, we have to, you know, look at that side of it because clearly we don't want to put the money into maintaining things because I, I, you know, I listen to these meetings and, you know, we seem to get upset about putting money into maintaining it and, Whatever we do, I mean, I have a building on the water. Every year I set money aside to maintain it because that's just mm -hmm. part of being on the coast. Absolutely. And it, we need to consider that. When it, whatever decision we make, I, you know, I, I think simple is better. And I like simple. People come to Camden because it is simple. You know, I, I love the waterfall for what it is. We don't need any development on it, just, you know, do whatever we can to preserve it and enjoy it. And people will be happy. They'll visit us by the thousands. And that mm -hmm. goes for Harbor Park. Um, right. That seawall, I'm talking too much. <laughs> that seawall, that seawall 
I think we could raise that seawall and adjust it to climate change. Um, and it will last for a long, long time. I think we can make adjustments. And same goes for Montgomery Dam. I think an engineer could look at that and, you know, get it so that it will last another 100, 200 years because there are so many factors with that, that pool, that, that dam, uh, that pool water is, needs to be addressed because we know that pool water, without that pool water there, all our buildings are gonna be exposed. So we have to look at those things. Um, yeah, you're, we you're all yeah, we, so we all, real quickly, we all designed our buildings for that pool of water. I don't know the, about the other buildings, you know, upriver, but, you know, in my area, we all designed our buildings for that pool of water and for the town to take that away, you know, that's, that's something we need to talk about. Sure. Agreed. And, and, uh, and uh, you're, you're talking to a preaching the choir regarding maintenance, everything we've considered in the town when somebody talked to us about a, a new lodge at Snowball, the cost of construction was discussed, but we discussed what is it going to cost to maintain it every year? Uh, you know, that's absolutely uh, everything we look at is, uh, is it has to have maintenance costs because that's a continuing cost. So I, you appreciate the choir there, I get it. I mean, not, I share a lot of your skepticism about the, the town, Tom. I mean, I don't, I don't personally want to be on the select board for the rest of my life. It um, can easily take up your entire life. Um, and, you know, when people started, for instance, wanting to be able to donate money to this, um, my first thought was no, no way do I want the town just to start some fund that is like the river restoration fund, because I don't trust the future town um, to be, you know, a, a guardian of that. I don't think the town is, the town of Camden isn't who I want to look to in the future to be like the scientific voice of reason of what, like what counts as river restoration or what would be good or bad. Um, and so trying to get, um, you know, organizations to evaluate the worthiness of this um, has been a big focus so that, you know, a, a nonprofit organization with that's you know, mission driven or, or federal agencies or whoever that, that have that expertise can be saying, okay, this is, this is worth us funding. This is worth, um, yeah, because I don't, I don't really trust the town either. And I can see why you wouldn't um, because a lot of the, you know, I think we've all seen it with state projects, with town projects, with there's talk about this or that, a lot of the time when the public hearing finally comes around, it's after the decision has sort of already been made and it's in defense mode. And, um, and then they say, oh, everybody's in such a hurry. Now we have to, there's some kind of urgent thing. So we have to just push this through. Um, and I think I, we don't want to do this here. We know that it all has to get majority support. So. I see your, you know, what you're saying, like, the, you know, the waterfall and the, that is, you know, a public landing sort of thing right now. People that like the sort of pretty nice part, quiet part of the public landing is over in that little nook. It's this waterfall that is created by the Montgomery Dam. And so um, if you take the dam away, you're impacting, you know, this, this nice little quiet space of, of the public landing. Um, I think there, there is some we can do here that doesn't require us to have figured out the whole plan for the boardwalk, um, for the, all of the public landing, you know, the tree planting plan for the parking, but that, um, you know, especially if we were to have a, a meeting with some of the immediate abutters, you know, maybe there is a way that we could, you know, figure out how some kind of a, of a, of a bridge or a boardwalk would um, be an asset for, both, you know, the, the public landing and the harbor and harbor park and the buildings. I think it hasn't been well understood in the past how, you know, like the bridge conversations, for instance, everybody says, oh, the bridge, you know, that makes everybody upset, but we haven't taken the time to figure out, um, you know, some people really like the idea of it and some people don't, but we don't really understand what the reasons are. Like I didn't, until you just said it today, I didn't know what your reason um, was and if we were all to talk a little bit more, um, you know, we might be able to find 
solutions. Um, I think some of the things that you're talking about with trying to create things that don't require massive amounts of maintenance, that, that is the focus of the grant program that we're in right now is that, you know, that's what they want us to focus on too. They've said, um, you know, if we get to the point where we decide that, you know, we just want to rebuild the, the dam as it is and put a fish ladder around it, they don't want to fund that kind of a project because they know that that requires a lot of maintenance in the future. Um, and so they want us to find solutions that can be um, lower maintenance. Um, I think the question is, can we find those types of solutions that are low maintenance, but then also really aesthetically pleasing? Um, and that understandably right now, when you open up that dam, it looks so bad. And so, you know, I really like the idea of, how, of you know, having more meetings, you know, just about Montgomery and with some of the business owners, you know, or all of them right there. So thank you for taking the time to be here, you know, not once, like but twice. Them. And, um. Hey, Allison, this is Kristen Smith. Um, hi, Kristen. hi. So I just wanted to make a few comments and I just wanted to say this is not as a, a budding property owner or as a library board member, but this, oh. this is just my own thoughts. And um, I love the idea of, of having a more natural area there and just having the ability for people to see what it would naturally look like without a dam and have the fish passage and have the whole area kind of open for education and also for our children. Um, you know, I think people are saying, well, you can make these temporary fixes, but how many times do you wanna do a temporary fix when we have the opportunity right now to do a more permanent fix? And, you know, I understand that, yes, that there's this pool of water, but there might even be opportunities to have that pool of water still exist with removal of the dam. Um, and I think aesthetically, it would actually be more pleasant to have a more natural looking waterfall and maybe have some sort of um, natural fish passage there. Um, so I personally, you know, am all for getting, you know, more understanding on this. And, you know, to Tom's comment about the businesses, I understand it, but also, you own your property, the town owns their property, they can do what they want with it. And it's great that they're getting input from the businesses, but it's also, um, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a guarantee that you will get what you want. And um, I think it's great that the town is getting so much input from everyone. And I really support the process that you're doing. Thank you, Kristen. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of, of different ways that dam removal can be designed. Um, I, I have seen examples where um, like that, you know, like a, the pool and sort of cascading waterfall effect was determined to be something that for historic reasons, uh, the community really wanted to keep. And so um, they designed a, I'm trying to remember that it was somewhere in Michigan, I think. Um, they designed a, you know, a recirculating feature for for part of it um there's a you know another place that has turned it into like a historical water wheel that can be seen and um in the you know the sheepskit river video we saw how uh, a you know a pool was carved out of the bedrock um and i think if we can you know the, there are a lot of different landscaping options um if we can start to get more input from people on like, okay, well, if the dam did go away, what would, you know, what would make it better or worse? Um, everybody, we can at least get to a point where maybe not everybody would be happy, but um, and some people might in the end prefer to leave it just exactly the way it is. But at least if, you know, we have to, somebody has to compromise in the long run. I'm sure everybody will have to compromise. We'll have some options that are a little bit closer to acceptable. Um, but you know, there are a lot of different ways that things can be landscaped to achieve the things that we decide we, you know, we really don't want to give up. I personally, I, you know, I love walking out on that dam to be able to see sort of the vantage, the high vantage point over the harbor. Um, and I, you know, a, a lot of people seem to like walking down that sluice way, even though it's a little bit 
um, dangerous, um, according to the insurance company. But, I th you know, I think we need to have a lot more, like Tom says, like, you know, a lot more conversations about the types of amenities or changes that could be made that, you know, that might be beneficial to everybody. Um, don't have any more um, questions for anybody watching on um, YouTube or here right now and just um, still digesting and not having the idea formulated. Um, you can uh, visit, first of all, the, the Mid Coast Conservancy website. They, um, I'll just actually pull it up. Um, real quick here. As we all know, the town of Camden probably isn't gonna win any awards for communication, although we really are trying to do um, better. And that's, but, you know, that's why we did this sort of talk series is instead of just waiting for the perfect moment when we had everything available to sort of un unveil, um, which never kind of works, we said, you know what, we haven't figured out the perfect plan for public input yet. so. Let's just try to do this um, and and just have it really broad because something would be better um, than nothing. And you know, this is all available on on YouTube, and we can keep accepting. I mean, comments are are always open, of course. Um, I'm going to share my. Am I sharing my screen? No. Um, so, if you want to get um, updates on anything um, sort of related to um, you know, the larger reasons why we would be looking at river restoration, um, anything to do with um, you know, really these, these grants um, that we have for the McGonagall River. Um, the town of Camden will continue to do our thing where you know, we'll put out agendas and um, put stuff on our website as much as possible, but Mid Coast Conservancy is taking a larger role in um, being a resource for people as well. So you can sign up for email um, alerts. Um, you can see you know, a little bit of the rationale behind the project and some links to different things um, here. And you can reach out to um, Sri Verrill um, or the just Mid Coast Conservancy in general for any kind of um, you know, technical questions. They handle a lot the, in the future, they'll be handling a lot of the um, like the permitting and things like that to do with DEP and um, helping the town to manage relationships with other project partners. Um, Coastal Mountain Land Trust is the major land trust in this area and they have, um, they're also the largest landowner in the McGonagall watershed. So um, Mid Coast Conservancy has developed a partnership with, um, with them, um, with NOAA, with, uh, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation with Trout Unlimited with, um, we're working with um, Downey Salmon Federation also. Um, so they're a resource. It's not that you can't, you can always contact the town of Camden as well and we can put you, um, you know, we can just listen or we can put you in touch with the right um, agency. But you know, this is just an additional resource um, for people that wanna feel like they can get um, questions answered in a more, you know, scientifically rigorous way, I suppose. Um, and yeah, I guess that is um, it. Thank you to everyone for being here. And um, you know, the first order of business is I'm um, gonna try to follow up Tom on um, how we can make uh, your idea happen. Um, Cause I do think that would be really valuable. So thank you so much. Mm-hmm.